Hey everyone! Today I'd like to go over all the Unity attributes that I've used to make my scripts more user-friendly. There are a handful of attributes I'm not going to cover, but they are fairly obscure, so check the description for a link to the full list. Let's start with serialization. So by default, public fields are serialized, and private fields are not serialized. So in this example, our first variable here will be serialized and show up in the inspector, whereas the second one won't. So we can see here, the first public field is serialized, whereas that non-serialized private field is not. But if we want to take a private field and make it serialized, we can use the serialized field attribute. So this would be for when you want a variable to show up in the editor, but not be visible to other scripts. Similarly, we can take a public field, which would usually be serialized, and mark it with the non-serialized attribute, making it not be serialized. This would be for variables that you want to be visible to other scripts, but not show up in the editor. There's also the hide and inspector attribute. This takes a serialized field and makes it not show up in the editor, but still be serialized. I've used this a couple times when I have a very large array that would be slow to display in the inspector, but I still want it to be serialized. Now let's talk about serializing classes and structs. Here we have two classes and one struct. The first variable is public, but its class is not explicitly marked as serializable. If we look down here, we can see there's no attribute, it's just a regular class. So even though this variable is public, because the class is not marked as serializable, it won't show up in the editor. We can see it's not there. But if we look at a different class here, which has been explicitly marked as serializable, with the serializable attribute, we can see that this public variable will show up in the editor. And similarly, this serializable struct has been marked as serializable, and so, if we look in the editor, we can see they're both serialized and show up, and you can edit them as you'd expect. Moving away from serialization, let's start with the header attribute. The header attribute doesn't apply to a specific field. It simply puts a header in the inspector at whatever location you put it in the file. So here we can see we have the serialization header and the numbers header and a couple of other ones. And we can see in the editor, we end up with these nice headers at just the location they appear in the file. Now let's look at some number attributes. We have the min attribute, which specifies a minimum value this variable can be set to, and the range attribute, which specifies a minimum and maximum this variable can be set to. Interestingly, there's no max attribute, but hopefully you can get what you want with just these two. So we can see here, with a min, we're allowed to go as high as we want, but it's gonna stop us, at the minimum we set of zero. And with the float attribute, we can see it's bounded to the range we specified. So between zero and 100. And similarly with the float, we go between zero and one or whatever you specify. And as you can see with the int, it locks you to integer values. And with the float, you're allowed to specify decimal values. Now for strings, we have the multi-line and the text area attributes. These both behave very similarly. They both allow you to create a multi-line text field, but in the case of the multi-line attribute, we just have this smaller box to the right here with a set height of four. So we can see it allows us to add up to four lines and then it starts scrolling, although we don't get a scroll box. Now with the text area attribute, in addition to specifying a minimum number of lines, we can also specify a maximum number of lines. And so what this means is, by default, the text area is going to be four lines tall. And then as we add more lines, it will actually expand to eight lines. And then past that, we get a scroll bar. I'm honestly not sure when I would ever use the multi-line attribute, but I just wanted to let you know it's there. For most situations, I specify a text area. Now for colors, we have the color usage attribute. And looking at its definition, we can see you can specify whether or not there's an alpha channel, whether or not it's an HDR color, and also a handful of other attributes. So going back to our file, here we're specifying a color that does have an alpha value and is an HDR color. So if we go to the editor, we can see we have an HDR color and we can specify values beyond the usual limit. And if we go back to our other color, we can see here we're saying there is no alpha channel and it's not an HDR color. So here we get a color 
where usually you would have a fourth slider for alpha. We can see there is none. Now, I would have assumed that in this configuration, it would default the alpha to one or full, uh, but it doesn't. The alpha is always going to be zero. So if you need to treat this as an opaque color, you're going to have to remember to set the alpha to one manually. So we also have the tooltip attribute, which lets us specify a tooltip that shows up if you hover over that field. So if we look here, we have field with a tooltip. And if you hover over it, you can see the tooltip text pops up. There's also the space attribute. So again, this can go anywhere in your file. And it just specifies some amount of vertical space at that location. So here we have what I think is 25 pixels of vertical space. There's also the context menu attribute. So this adds a context menu to the top of your script, which will then call whatever function is below it. So here we have the do something context menu. If we go back to the inspector at the top, if we click the dots, at the bottom here we have this new option called do something. And if we click on it, it will run that function. Similarly, we have the context menu item attribute. So this applies to a particular field. And when you right click on this field, it will call whatever function you specify as the second parameter. It takes a string, but I like to use the name of method to get the name of the function. So I don't have to worry about making the string passed in here always match the name of the function. Uh, by using name of, if I change this function to some other name, I'll get an error as opposed to it failing silently. So with this context menu item, we can see if we go to the inspector and right click on that item, we can see the context menu pops up. And if we click it, it runs the function. Going up to the top of the file, we have the add component menu attribute. So this allows you to specify a custom path to go to in the add component menu to create this script. So here we can see we create a demo folder and then we call our script, script to demo unity attributes. Going to the editor, if we click add component, we see we have a new folder called demo and inside it is our new name. So interestingly, in addition to adding this menu, it also changes the name that the script shows up as in the editor. So our script is actually called unity attribute demo, but you can see the header here says our custom name, script to demo unity attributes. Next, we have the require component attribute. So this allows us to require a different component in addition to ours whenever we add it to a game object. So in this case, we're saying whenever we add our component to a game object, that game object also has to have a rigid body. So in practice, what this does is, let's delete all these here. So if we add our component by going to demo and our custom name here, we can see because this game object currently doesn't have a rigid body, if we add our script, it will automatically add a rigid body for us. And similarly, if we try to delete this rigid body without first deleting our script, we'll get an error saying that our script depends on it. Next, we have the help URL attribute, which allows us to specify a custom URL for when you click the help link in the inspector. So with this custom Google URL, we can see in the inspector, if we click the help button for our script, it will open a browser to our custom link, in this case, to Google. And finally, we have the selection base attribute. So this is an interesting one. So usually in the editor, when you click on something visual, like a sprite renderer, it will select that renderer's game object. But if you use the selection base attribute, what will happen is whenever you click on a visual item in the scene, it will search upwards into its parents until it finds a script that has the selection base attribute on it. For example, let's say you had a player script that was on the root of your prefab, and then below that, you had other game objects with the player's visuals on it, you know, sprite renderers, mesh renderers, etc. cetera. Um, by default, if someone clicks on those sprite or mesh renderers, it's just gonna select that game object the renderer is attached to. But if your player script has the selection base attribute added to it, when you click on the sub-object's renderers, it will actually search up through the hierarchy and find your player script and select your player script's object instead of the object with the renderers on it. I think this could be very useful in situations where you have lots of enemies and players, and usually when you're clicking on them in the editor, 
you want to select the root object, not the sub-object with the visuals. So those are all the Unity attributes that I've found useful. Check the description for a link to this demo file and a link to the Unity documentation. If you found this video informative, please like, comment, and maybe even subscribe. Thanks for watching.